explore and expose the factors that affect, has affected the struggle for gender inequality in democratic processes. What is being done? And if enough is being done, and if, not, if enough is not being done, what can we do and what can we do differently? I mean, it's only madness for you to keep doing the same things and expect a change. So if we're doing things and we've not seen the change that we desire, is it time for us to change captain? Well, we need to interrogate these issues, right? And all about changing, challenging the status quo and challenging the gender bias. It's very important that the conversations today be geared towards discussing both gender bias and the status quo. The status quo as of today, at this moment, is that women occupy less than 10% of national leadership worldwide. It has become very necessary to interrogate the continuing gender inequality with the aim of prospering solution. It's not for us to gather online and physically and talk and talk and then we go home. No. It's not business as usual. We are not just here to expose what the issues are. There has to be solutions. Because one of the outcomes of this event today will be to produce a policy paper. It will also help other civil society organizations to know where and how to intervene. And so before we go any further, we will go with a spoken word by a poet, Salamatu Sudi. Please a round of applause for her. The society trying hard to bury her grief, her great achievement, as if she's not very much deserving. Now, listen, the woman. A life giver whose blessed hands cover all she nurtures, never tiring, only love for all desiring. The woman. Give succor, strength, and solace. The woman provides for, protects for always, like a tree whose shade is ample, growing upward an example. Always standing at her station, a true builder of our nation. See, men, babes, children round her rally because she is a woman phenomenally. And I am proud. Thank you. General of the Jonathan Foundation Dialogue on Democracy and the Voice of Women. We lay a great emphasis on the importance of democracy towards achieving peace and progress. Democracy goes beyond the ritual of periodic elections. It is a process of nation building and a tool for peacemaking. As the world confronts the COVID 19 pandemic, there is a greater responsibility for African nations to work towards proper democratization of the continent as the promises of democracy are those that will foster peace and lead to inclusive and prosperous nations. Values such as justice, freedom, equality are better realized in the democratic setting. True democracy guarantees free and fair elections and peaceful transfer of power from one administration to another. True democracy is hinged on inclusivity and respect for human rights. True democracy is about addressing inequalities and institutionalizing justice for all citizens irrespective of their gender, ethnicity, and faith. I have previously said that democratizing Africa goes beyond conducting elections. We must involve, we, we must involve building strong and stable institutions that will translate into equality, access to justice, and guarantee peace for all. With strong institutions, we can address some of the factors that have hindered the segment of our society from participating actively in politics. At the heart of our discourse today is how to build an inclusive society, a society of justice, where women can access democratic rights and participate actively in politics like their male counterparts. According to the United Nations, gender equality will not be reached among heads of government until 2150, another 130 years, except drastic actions are taken by all stakeholders. 
The report by the UN Women reveals that despite increase in engagement in public decision making roles, equality is far off. Women hold about 21% of the exterior positions globally. Only three countries have 50% or more of women in parliament, and 22 countries are headed by the woman. As a foundation, our aim is to see that we close this gap in our nation, and that is why a dialogue of this nature is very important. Gender equality is a fundamental human right, and we must continue to emphasize and advocate for its place in our democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, the call for gender equity should not be seen or perceived as an attempt to empower only women. Rather, it is a call to build an inclusive, just, and peaceful society. It is this belief that made me during my time in office not only ensure that it fight for political action, but also entrust women with key positions in my cabinet and other government agencies. Giving women and men equal opportunity for self actualization helps us as a society to ensure the maximum utilization of our human potentials. Women and girls today make up for 50% of the Nigerian population, and excluding their needs denying the Nigerian society the opportunity to harness half of its human resource potential. As a society, we must go beyond the rhetorics and be intentional about building an inclusive society. The outlook and formation of our institutions, whether formal or informal, in our policies and offices of our national life, must be seen to be in support of women and not as barriers. We must consciously build a society where the girl child will dare to dream, knowing fully where she can achieve such a dream, irrespective of her gender. But when you look at all that has been happening about women's participation, I want to say that most of the international organizations are just paying good service to this issue because there are certain other aspects of life that they try to enforce or entrench in the various countries. Why haven't they done something you know, that um, impacts you on this particular issue? So it's uh, a case of women themselves you know, knowing what is good for them and taking you know, that decisive action. Even though we need the laws, we need the countries, we need everybody to back us up. Uh, so I think women themselves have a, a role to play in this. Uh, secondly, when you have when we have events talking about issues like this, you find that people are not really interested in coming. I've always said that they, we cannot achieve anything without the men. So the men must be willing to collaborate or to go along with us in, on this issue of women's participation because they started a very long time ago. And they need to know that if you leave more than half of the world population behind in decision making, there's nothing that is going to happen concerning development and progress. You have rightly hit the nail on the head. And the question that you raised about uh, having a man join, I think this is important. Because many times women have been having a monologue. And how would you have a conversation around politics, around democracy with yourself? These are the issues that we need to interrogate. If you listen very carefully at the speech of His Excellency President Jonathan Bullock, you will hear that it's not trying to push men out. It's talking about an inclusive society. It's talking about a sustainable process. It's talking about where everybody has a voice. And this is the definition of democracy. Government of the people, for the people, by the people. And by the way, the people men, women. So I'm very excited that already we have started to interrogate the issues and we follow the trajectory that you have clearly elucidated and hopefully uh, we'll be able to come out of it, uh, not a different number, but we'll be able to make sense out of the questions that you have earlier raised. How do we make women participate more in politics beyond going out to vote on the election day? I mean, you have done more than just voting. So how do we make women participate in politics more than just going out on election day to vote? Contesting election or participating in politics is about level playing field, is about the circumstances that exist in the different localities. You know, for me, I would say maybe from school, 
I was uh, passionate about who emerged as uh, president of the student union, you know, director of socials, all those people. And there are just some people who are born politicians. You just find yourself into that, trying to correct things, you know, while you are still coming up, you know, very young and all that. So it was not difficult for me when in 1998 the idea of democracy was coming back and all that. I just you know, felt that I had to be part of it. I needed to lend my voice. I wanted my people uh, to elevate my people, you know, where I come from and all that. So I was living in Lagos then. I joined PDP in Lagos, but I went back home to go and contest the election because I felt, okay, they needed this exposure more and they needed somebody who they can rely on, you know, to represent them. So the circumstances is what determines who is participating in politics. There's been a lot of uh, advocacy, engagement, and women should join. But you see, the, those things that characterize our politics in Nigeria discourage a lot of people. The very few women that you find who are shouting up and down, who are contesting election, are those who are praising the Lord. They are the ones who feel that, no, no matter what, I can do this. For somebody like me, I've determined that Within you know, this political environment, I was bring about a change, and that's why I'm still there. I mean, you heard what Honorable Mulukat said. And my question is I'm still going to repeat that same question. How do we make women participate in politics just beyond way not to, to vote? Judging from her submission, is participation a lack of interest or a lack of motivation? We need to revisit our history as a people. That the very structures of our traditional systems always included. But then with the, the subjugation of people, first by color and then by gender and then by class, that women were then reduced in their positions in society. And that we have enforced this generation after generation, decade after de decade, so that we would tell girls to be ambitious, but not more ambitious than their husbands. That we will tell people, um, and when you think, for example, of positions and structures, if you and I were to attend a meeting, and we were to be in a committee, that we would say, uh, let us elect the chairman, and then in tokenism, we would say, the secretary should be a woman. And that token, way of treating people as being less because they are women is the same mentality that we have carried into governance. And let's be clear, that Nigeria is not a democracy yet. If half of your people cannot be found in your leadership, and I'm not talking about ethnicity, before ethnicity even happens, that first that gender, we must overcome that gender barrier to say that you are a human being, who sapien sapien, before you are a gender. And that till we get it into our heads that human beings are first human beings and deserving of participation in leadership, participation in free thoughts of, uh, and having a voice and agency, that we're, we're still joking as a people. There is a sort of willingness. And that is the social construct built around gender roles. Who should do what? And we all buy into it. Born, what of that? You know, socially, women should do this, men is this. And we socially reinforced around the political discussion that, oh, politics is dirty, and women are noble. Oh, I mean, why would you do nocturnal meetings? Why would you join them? And if you see a woman politician, oh, she left her house. So we're all guilty of embellishing this construct. And I dare say there's an unwillingness even for women to accept it themselves. A woman politician, ha ah, ah, you're supposed to be at home. Because politics has remained largely a musky and slimy environment where only strong men dominate. So we, we must tell ourselves the truth, that there is some unwillingness. But gradually, the discussions around equity, around inclusivity, deconstructing those hybrid ideas of identity, 
and do some clear analysis of need. Do we need to move forward? Do we have to be creative to find a way to solve our problem of the underdevelopment? Our societies where there are collective action, where women and men have equal access to power and opportunity, are they more prosperous? So we begin to have empirical evidence. They will all be having meetings and meetings like uh, answer and closing the shop and going and the challenges to make. And this is what I think this conversation should be kind at. Do we have evidence that societies that are more inclusive are more prosperous? And I say yes. Why do you go abroad for holidays? How many people are coming to our care for holidays? Why is it that we are cited when we get citizenship of America, all of the UK? Because they have raised the burden given to equality and opportunity for both men and women. You, you heard what you gave me when Honorable Monica was speaking, you heard what Abby said, you heard what Dr. Monica said. My question is, haven't we heard all these things before? Is it not the same old things we've been hearing for the past years? What are we doing that we shouldn't be doing? And how can we begin to do things differently? What I think we need to do differently is to emphasize the empowerment, sustained deliberate, long term of the girl child in a way that she understands that she can be anything, she can do anything, and that those historic barriers that make it possible for her to do what she's supposed to do are taken away. Take for instance the issue of child marriage, which we know is hampering the ability of a lot of girls to accept. As more and more kids are getting roped up in what is modern day slavery as much as I'm concerned, a lot of voices are being subsumed. Pardon. So flipping it and looking for affirmative action in some of the fundamental barriers that are holding women that women down. We talked about issues of uh, uh, inheritance. And if you look at the link between access to land in places like the Southeast and access to credit, yeah. which in turn gives you economic empowerment, which in turn makes it possible for you as a wife to tell your husband to go to hell if she's standing in the way. When you take away something as basic as right of inheritance, you are again making it impossible for millions of women to speak for themselves. So that is the kind of affirmative action that I'm proposing. Why are not discountenancing the need for us at a political level to ensure that women have a seat on the table? I think we should be able to build the grassroots, the, to build the rural women in such a way that they are the ones that determine who sits at the table. We should be the one actually in the next 10, 20 years asking for affirmative action. Before we continue, we're, we're, we're running, but I would like to take comments or questions from members of the audience. If you have a question, please indicate by raising your hand and we'll come to you. One of our online uh, participants. And I think this is an intervention. How can we begin to change language that has been embedded within us for eons? I would strongly suggest that the National Orientation Agency do some work behind the education. I would also suggest that schools begin to look at incorporating the importance of women and girls in their teaching curriculum. Media still has a very critical role to play. To date, you still see ads that show women doing domestic chores and men going to the office. We need to go from rhetoric and really start making new changes. In terms of um, the constitution for us, uh, the, coalition, the coalition of civil society groups led by the German Trust and CDD as well as many politics forum and others, and we are taking the federal government to court for the and courts. And when we are looking for interpretation, the clear states in the constitution. In looking at the constitution, there is no way in the constitution that states a chairperson. It is always a chairman. When the former ESC chairman, Farida Wazi, was ESC, head of ESC, she was always addressed as chairman. Those sensitive issues, like I like them, are some of those gender issues that we need to address in this country. When you look at all these key positions, Chair, chair. We need that to be translated to things like chairperson. 
So even if it's a man or a woman taking that position, he or she will be addressed based on his or her gender. Um, also, I think uh, looking at um, the 2019 election for us, um, we did a lot of work working with, alongside UN Women and other development partners. And we are a society we're actually very discouraged with the outcome of the women participation in 2019. Looking at the participation, now, we had over 2,800 2, women contesting all positions from the House of Assembly to the Senate to the National Assembly, flag and the President. And we had less than 70 women elected into office. That, that figure is just too low. What are the issues? The issue is that, okay, we, have, we won't say we have a large number of women participating. So we can manage 2008 participating. Or why would we have 70 out of 2008 being elected? That is less than 5%. So even if we have 10,000 women contesting, you cannot say that that percentage will go up. So that is one thing I think we should look at once. Look at once again. Um, all these engagements we have, um, do we have that political will to make this happen? That is one. On the second part of it, and thank you to Jude as well, who have mentioned um, the strategy which we have been using for a couple of years now. We might think at a lower level of um, engagement where we go down to the community. But do we even have that engagement? Because the National Action Plan also looks at the federal level, where, where we have the subnationals for some states who have not even signed up to it. So how do we engage and ensure like the gender and equal opportunities bill is out there and effective, or if possible, the government signs on to it? Or secondly, um, looking at the Girl and the Child Rights Act, which is also supposed to be implemented, how do we ensure civil society organizations push for this and um, we have we can see like the future we want for, for, for the girl child? So I think I think it's been a very uh, a fruitful uh, conversation, and uh, I will lend my voice to the others to say that this has to be a continuous conversation. Uh, our advocacy has to be measured, uh, context sensitive, and realistic. Um, but th this is this is this is going to be uh, a process. But let us not kid ourselves. I think as a country, we've made some progress. We need to acknowledge the fact that the level of awareness, conversation that we are having around issues concerning women is remarkably improving and increasing every year. That in itself is progress. It might not be as, we might not get everything we want right away, but I think the trajectory is very promising. This should be a one-off. It should be sustained. We should also open up conversation around the violence, around the political process. And like you know, uh, democracy is not just the election day. How aware have we made the, voting, the voters to know? How are we mobilizing uh, people to effectively participate? How uh, we can translate our noise to action? Uh, we talked about voices. Uh, the female voices are more audible during singing, you know, chanting, and we, we really enjoy it. How can you encourage women that is not just collecting the bags of rice uh, and making noise after collecting it, that our voices mean much more than that. So th these are some other areas that I'm hoping that going forward uh, we will begin to have a more structured uh, conversation on this. Finally, mentorship. This is critical. You know, in the West, they're very deliberate about mentorship. There is that generational transfer. And if you look at the American president, there are certain universities or places, all of them must have passed through at the same time. Not at the same time, but, you know. So we have to also consciously uh, mentor young men, young women, and I put it young men, young men, and have quality. Uh, one of my friends who's a non Nigeria said, the people that represent Nigeria look nothing like Nigerians themselves. That is what we should begin to see. How can the Nigerians that I know look like those in power? Thank you so much. And uh, a better Nigeria to be able to Thank you. Uh, online participants, you are the best. They say from 10 till now, we really appreciate you. And of course, uh, thank you. And like you said, the policy paper will be developed.
It is our hope that civil society organizations will use the recommendations from this forum today to begin to intervene. And we heard, I've learned a lot. Change the